Welcome everyone. Thank you for, so much for joining us tonight. My name is Sarah Odsley and I'm the Writing Across Media Facilitator at Vermont Studio Center. If you're not familiar with, with, with VSC, um, we are located in Northern Vermont and we are a year round residency program for visual artists and writers. I wanna take a minute to acknowledge that Vermont Studio Center operates on land, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and is home of the Abenaki people. We honor, recognize and respect these peoples as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we gather. Right now it's spring in Vermont, which means that we have this weird season called mud season. So everything is melting and the river that runs through Vermont Studio Center's campus is called the Gihon and it is swollen. <laughs> it's full and it's brown of snow melt. <laughs> um, thank you for being here from wherever you are. Tonight is our Writers on the Rise featured reading with Chekwu A. Dunlady. Sorry. Um, this reading series is designed to uplift and amplify the diverse talent of a wide range of voices and creative visions. I, it is such a pleasure for me to say that this reading is sponsored by the Rana Jaffe Foundation, um, which supports women writers throughout their literary careers. We are grateful for the foundation's ongoing support of our women writers here at Vermont Studio Center. It also is an, is an even extra pleasure to mention that our reader tonight is a VSC alum. She was a resident here writing in the Maverick Writing Studios in May of 2018. She is the author of Semiotics, winner of the Cave Canem Poetry Prize. Her chapbook, Take Me Back, was included in the New Generation African Poets, nine box set. She has received fellowships and support from Callaloo, Combilio, the Lam Lamba Literary Foundation, Hed Hedgebrook, Vermont Studio Center, and the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing. From Lago Lagos, by way of West Baltimore. She is currently based in Chicago, where she teaches writing at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Turning it over to you. Cool, thank you, Sarah. Um, all right, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you all for being here. Um, it, it's, it's nice to have this bulk of time, I guess, um, to, talk a little bit more fully about some of some of my recent projects. So um, in the space of time that we have, I, I'm going to share some poetry. Um, and um, I made, I, I was a little overzealous maybe, I made a, a very quick um, series of slides of some visual art. And then um, I'll share just a little bit from uh, my novel in progress as well. Um, so I'll start with poetry. Um, I'll read um, just a few poems from um, from semiotics. I'm going to set a timer so I don't go on too long. Um, so this first poem that I read is is called Tomorrow Shaka Demas Will Play. While I braid my hair long, thump coconut oil between the sections, crack palm nut with my teeth, Rub the meat on my belly. I'll want to go dancing. Might go to the shake and bake. I'll bless Ma with a salah. Tuck a mini skirt in my purse for later. Might wear lipstick too. There'll still be red henna on my hands from cousin Zainab's wedding. They might bend around one black man's waist. When we dance like we are blood, we'll both wonder was the slave trader your ancestor or mine? His rum-laced tongue will coat my lobes. I'll think of his mama while he bonds to me. I can get home myself, I'll say. I'll creep in, pass mama on the sofa, drink coffee to mask the sex oozing from me. 
I'll eat leftover jalaf cold from the pot. I'll heave. I might struggle with sleep. Um, the second poem is, is called uh, Ji Hao Shi, which translates um, into uh, meaning to be, to be pissed off. I was hammered the first night of Ramadan, guilty as if Allah believed it me, even if not so many other outlets for discord, coitus, purple urkel, acupuncture, such practicality in things. I could have showered and had war sung out of me. My other name, Husena, pressed like a razor to my temple and I thought to lean into it, knowing for my people the many uses of the cow, milk, butter, meat. Against the tiles where I arrived, I shouted, Slaughter, are you looking to marry? Why else come home? Menene mutum. If not someone to praise name the clots my gut miscarried months earlier. I'll want that ache again, a hunger to walk the evening with. I was at my mother's ear while she killed anything. The cock's neck in her hand at 86's Eid the flesh sacrifice mutual, so many pleasures guaranteed. So nothing beautiful ends here. Her largesse brought prone, me an oracle awaiting elsewhere, awaiting questions elsewhere, afflicted to hurt nothing but myself. She too withstood love's accretion by holding fingers to flame, yet did make up her face that dusk wearing her body like a sin, only soothed by eating nono, munshanu, nama. Most of her is since covered, her kneeling pious, a soul belated in exchange for a scent and clean firmament. What is a man? One coming soon to hold night against her. Too early, it was that low blown wind, a worm up her skirt. Yet alone in the kitchen, she broke the fast anyway. Um, this third poem is called uh, Spontaneous Repulsion. Times look to us a tensile hook and tug taught best by the natural world's anguished kinks, bird in a gator's teeth, lush afterglow of unrepentant earth, having given itself to be scorched. Then us, who better to catalog our failures, having been inside each at the same time, grounded by eating overripe figs, thanking the table's barrier, asking aloud for coffee, close call to feeling, a monophony of coyotes. This one brave as hell, strutting in hair all over ripe. Braved coming into hair hell, come with my sickly smell. Pull the corner store still frame at its grubby edges. Our flower dress mid thigh, waist beads showing through loosened buttonholes the aroused hum of such hungry hours. Or because of our growing into mother's face, of us who's not inclined, so ask some days to name a child, theoretically. Who but she knows tomorrow, the name we'd give, an all right bet. But the body barks back constantly, dark elbows, barbelled nipples clanking the plexiglass display. Swisher sweet, a bamboo bitch, skin lightening cream. Nothing cares to hold past one long maybe. Envision mother in ourself 
in the whirl, holding back the days we bit our lip in glee when Ma's hands hovered over our childish heads never still. Ma's hand pulling the plate too hard, initiating our apart. Um, and then this last poem that I read is a, a newer one um, and I guess kind of still in progress. <laughs> um, I guess we'll, let's call it a second draft. It's in second draft stage um, and it's, it's called Tranquility. In the downpour of this day's nicked throat, imperial blue, red, blue, red, upon another useless waking. It's all mixed up now, and the sky is pitch hollow. Only zombies roam the roads. Donna love for flesh and break their skins for pity. I'll have to live in it, monkey suit at least some ordinary hours, the fifth day sober, sincere and dragging my poor will brought along. Two rough black stones in my pocket, parched need, since every sense must be now so express, a bird's yellow voice, pillow soft concrete at night. At least it was summer, no sick skin in sight, deep orange and blending right in, borderline intangible. A bomb sets off at the end of the street and the children break out in sweet laughter, their fathers too. Finally, happy men, shit. My blood is pressing on me hard in the light show. Exile is very romantic, isn't it? Tending a lifelong blues, chronically remaking the same expulsion, always holding arms up and out, always holding out. It really reminds me of the age of swift knuckles, eyes readied as blades, hard all day. Still can't shake the tired of it, that young rage, a bomb sets off right beneath my window, bile green aftershocks. When it was winter, there had been the usual chronic runny white haze, wanting from such a short distance, only a cold hole to cringe at. Sometimes I imagined her cool breath to my ear carrying that sweet smell of cooking caramel. Get over it. It's a shame to be so hungry for your own blood, truly. Nothing settles it. Every turn of day to night has a grinding edge. So far as I'm concerned, I've suffered enough of it. No more. Okay, um, that's it for poems. <laughs> Um, I, as a, I guess as a, hopefully what feels like a treat for the eyes, um, I'm going to share really quickly, um, where is it? Just a couple of slides, I guess, um, of some visual work, because even though I don't really, I don't feel confident enough perhaps to call myself a visual artist, um, I, I definitely feel as though since my time at VSC, um, I have had a chance to explore some of that a little bit more. Um, and so the route is probably there in Vermont, um, but I've been kind of taking on uh, new, new projects. So I'll just share a couple of like quick slides and not try not to talk too much about them and just let you see it. Um, there we go. Let me get full screen. Uh, let's see. It's stuck. Give it a second. Okay. So this is um, these first two pieces, I guess, were my first foray into messing with stuff. <laughs> um, I really, I've, I've learned that I really like different kinds of like text, textiles. And I think of 
Kanekalon, which is that like weave hair as, a, as its own kind of textile. So these first two pieces that, that came up were um, uh, an opportunity for me to, to practice that while also sticking to the form I know, which is of course text. Um, and then I had the chance to make this, what do we call it? I guess we could call it a video poem. Um, but I, at the time I wasn't thinking of it as that. It was, I was just exploring the, the medium of video a little bit and really curious about um, what I felt I could say there. So these are just some stills from it since I didn't want to play the whole video, but I have the link if anyone is interested, I'll, I'll share that. Um, and it's the shadowy figure is me um, dancing badly <laughs> um, and in front of a camera, in front of a camera and, and some red light. Um, I won't say too much about that piece, but it is kind of influenced by a little bit by West African and Afro diasporic um, conceptions of queer feminine gender. Uh, there's a there's a anthropomorphic creature um, of the sea who who kind of gender bends and, and is known to, to wreak havoc in, in people's lives as a result. And I, I'm really interested in that concept and, and uh, deity, I guess, and um, what sort of subversive um, opportunities exist, I guess, in, in incorporating that into a post-colonial identity. So that's kind of what that video is about. Um, and then these last two pieces that I'm showing are just uh, just to give y'all, I guess, a little bit of a sense of the stuff I'm interested in now. Still finding myself really drawn to um, textiles and, and different fibers, um, but uh, because I like the intimacy of working on it. Um, also really interested in the dark <laughs> in general um, and utilizing different sorts of space uh, to think of, to use as portals, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's what these two are. This last one is gonna be the cover art um, for the Black Poetry Review, which is a micro art and poetry journal based in Iowa City, the University of Iowa. So that's been a nice opportunity to, it, this piece is paired with a poem um, that I wrote also. It's been a nice opportunity to see the two come together more fully, uh, but yeah. I'll stop sharing that. And then um, as a way to close, I'll just, I just wanted to read, oops, there we go. Um, a brief excerpt from my novel in progress. Um, it's, <laughs> I won't be able to share very much just in the span of time, but um, I'll just share a few pages. It, the, the book is called Flat 17 and this excerpt is taken from the title called, uh, the section titled Zazi, which follows a young woman who has recently returned to Abuja, Nigeria after finishing her degree in the UK. Um, and you'll see a little bit of it. She was rejected by her family when she returns. Um, so she moves into this space with other, other queer people. Um, and in, in that process, she encounters a, a haunting um, by an ancestral demon. Um, the lingering aftermath of a, of a centuries long curse. Um, so that's a little bit of context. Um, I'll just read a few pages of that. Zazi, part three. When the demon first came to me, my mother was already a miserable bitch and my father was already cut down, absent in a nod. Foul smelling, my people were all already dead. Nothing inside. The rot already transforming into hard carbon. They've dreamed only of European bleached and combed shores, high speed and glittering trains, many hands at work to clear their rubbish. They dreamed only of the most expensive trade. What of their own flesh they could pilfer in exchange for something white and empty. They were grateful only for the sharp and exacting lines that existed between them and the heavy sweating masses gathered outside the gates of their estates. My mother turns up her nose. Mother, 
trying to sell us plastic nonsense, wishing we will let them in, I beg. My mother weeps for being trapped in this shameful country and often phones her own mother, white and withering away in London, readily forgetful of her half-caste daughter left behind in that far off shameful nation. Granny had come here to live out her lust and had learned instead of true domination. Now she dominates from a distance in the tradition of her people. My mother says, do not be proud of your people who were taken from Africa only to suffer the misfortune of being brought back. 18, when I came home from Accra, my mother sent me to London to find a husband at the university. Look for someone white, says mother. Try your best. I went off my other motherland. My grandmother refused me from her home each and every Saturday and sent her chauffeur to me with 200 quid each following Sunday to tide you a bit, my dear. Wretched cunt. I spent the money on pussy. Grandmother's money loved pussy. Pussy came to my dorm room and we would drink red wine. Pussy and I went out to eat, traveled for Coke and Peckham, showed our tits for booze in the city center before ending so many nights with delicious frottage. I found a white woman who loved my strange accent and showed me off to her friends. I was in love with her for between three and four minutes. The demon was in her face, smiling, just a glimpse in her jawline, which moved hard against its own muscle. I gathered once for lunch with her other lovers, a woman from Thailand, an Afghan, another black woman, German, and a Belarusian who spoke no English. We ate warmed bread and bland eggs and smiled occasionally at each other. You'll need protection, my white woman once told me, taking a pause from our, mid from our touch midday. The filthy London air snuck in through her open window. All my others are jealous of you because of how fond of you I've been. She meant nothing. And I left London having had my fill of white and empty, a useless few years, a degree from a course I hardly can recall. When I came home, 23, my mother bought me a car to honor my return. So I won't have to see you again for a while, said mother. She called me inside, up with her to her bedroom where she sat in front of her vanity smoothing on cold cream and worrying about her fairness, then looking for my gaze, her Bible suddenly in her hands. The terror was visible in her eyes. I see the demon in you getting stronger. Her voice even kind, defeated. But madness shall not prosper. Let me pray for you. She spoke in hollers and begged the silence for my blood-covered salvation. In Jesus Christ's magnificent name, demon, I cast you out. Out, demon, I cast you out. Cover this girl in Christ's blood, my God. But my blood had long vacated and the demon moved calmly through me. I laughed, interrupting my mother's prayer and she cast me out with a new bank card and an account to Bank of Africa. Mother says, so you should not have to come back here soon. I drove myself to see Fadi, who promised me room in the flat when I came home. I had no words to share. Still, she gave me a kiss on the cheek. The big bedroom is all yours. Nafisa left last month to go back to Kano. She left me alone like I needed. The big room had its big bed, a vanity with an oval mirror, a window barred and looking out against another cement wall. Small gutter running in between. 
I had all I needed. I needed rest and took to bed. On my breath, I carried a curse for my mother, her downfall, her rapid aging, her darkening, her death eventually, and let the pain tire me and carry me to sleep. I jumped in black until I heard a sweet voice in my ear, a woman's to my liking, like a sigh, a small kiss, something light carrying the fragrance of nectar brushing against me. Are you ready to see me? Because it will mean confronting and abandoning your gods. Sweet dream, I whispered back, yes. In my dream, I could feel pinching on my toes, then long bones around my ankle. So I kept dreaming and kept my eyes closed. Then he squeezed tighter and my foot was colder than blue fire. I could open my eyes so I was forced to see. And I saw him, recognized him inherently, but my mouth brought nothing forward, no offering in exchange for mercy no supplication, no sound. He was a horrible sight, melting skin, the brittle gray of ash, his eyes exactly like mine, nearly black, large and sunk. His tongue was coated in dried blood, crackled and frayed again and again. His voice of smoke, deep and tattered. And when he spoke, and when he spoke, he opened his mouth. When he spoke, I too was made to speak. Do you get? His voice was trilling. The sound of crickets with layers of soot pouring out and through. Out came in the air and light around me at every closure, ripping from my throat. Demon, I know you do not doubt otherwise, nor that you can ever be away from me of me. You and me are we. With you I have long been tethered to your blood and drinking long from it. With you, taking and giving your breath. Put hair long ago. I know you wholly in particular. Zazi, daughter of Bridget Chioma, Peter's ransom, beget of quick lust and of that old white woman who is now elsewhere, where she is also a demon, where she has surrounded herself with gold ripped out from this land. Zazi, daughter of Jeffrey Ayuba Ransom, former Ondo State Governor and current Limp Dick, son of Wilson Ibrahim Ransom, former head of local and public relations at Niger Coast Export Company. I brought them their wealth and bring your own to you, your father, whose blood I still drink from. I dragged your father through war and granted him no mercy, damned to endure and remember. He's given me every magnificent drink. You, you have let me in. Everywhere you have been, every woman you have tasted, I've tasted her too. Everything has been shared with me. So my belly is always full, yet you, you are still so hungry. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to take a minute to invite people who are here to give a round of applause if you want to on mute. Feel free to do so. <laughs> Thanks, pals. Hi, Sam. <laughs> Sam is my student, everyone. Um, and Anunya is my sister. Hi, sister and student. <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. Um, um, I like this audience size because it reminds me of like pre-COVID readings. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, yeah, the, I mean, the novel you're working on. Wow. Where, um, where are you in, uh, where are you in with that? Where are you in the process of, of, of that project? You said you've been working on it for a while. Yeah, I've been working on it for now, I want to say four, almost four years. Um, and the current draft that I'm on is the second, uh, like real version, the second full draft that, um, that, I'm, that I'm in. Um, and I feel like I'm maybe, I want to say a little under halfway done because I don't want to overestimate my, <laughs> my doneness. Let's say it's about 40% done, um, which is good. I'm moving slowly through it, you know? Um, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I need to, because it's just going to take, it's just taking, it's taking as long as it needs to take, um. But so how, how have you found um, working, moving from working in poems, like individual, which, which, which you get these like individual little packages of, you know, sentences and syntax and, you know, metaphor, image, line, the relationship between the line and the sentence um, versus like the larger um, maneuvering of a novel. Um, I mean, in some way, in some ways it's more fun because you have like literally like more canvas to like work in. Um, but how, how have you found moving from, um, from poems to, to longer form to like, to fiction? Um, it's been, well, one, it's harder to do because you just have to write literally more words, <laughs> which probably sounds ridiculous and like an asinine thing to say, but there's just so many more words in fiction compared to poetry. Um, which is, I have to often remind myself, you don't have to like rush to say this. You have more than three lines to say this. You can take up a few pages if you want, you know? Um, so that's been, that's been part of the, the difference, I guess. Um, but you know, the, and I, I say this to my, to my students who lately I've been asking a lot of like cross work from. The interesting thing is that the poetry has definitely started to bleed more into the fiction than I than I really ever anticipated, um, and that actually feels kind of nice. Um, it, I, I'm really invested in writing lyric-driven fiction, um, and that's since making that, since confirming that for myself, it's it's really um, helped me just think more expansively about what I can do there. Yeah, for sure. Um... Crystal Wilkinson was our visiting writer this month and she um, is kind of anti-plot <laughs> um, and, and she gave a craft talk on um, kind of making your story be, that is a quiet story but also make it, make it move and have movement and have the illusion of movement um, which functions like which is what plot gives you I guess um, and uh, anyway, it was a really interesting craft talk. I recommend it. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I always like kind of envy, like, and want to be a fiction writer, but I don't know, like if I have the endurance for taking on like a, a longer project like that, that would take like multiple years. Um, but it's silly because I'm a poet. So, and it does take multiple years regardless of what you're working on. Um, yeah. But I, what I also really appreciated was uh, I didn't know that you were you were working in the visual arts as well. Um, and when I was a resident here at Vermont Studio Center, um, I, I was very envious of my visual artist friends, like how they have like an external object that you end up making um, that is like externally like that is like a tangible like physical has a physicality to it. And then it's an object that exists like outside of the body. Um, and, um, even though I also think that poems themselves are objects, um, that are containers for feelings or, you know, and emotion and memory and all that. Um, but there's something like, that's really nice to have that tactile, um, feeling of having an object. And I'm wondering, um, when, like, when you started making, like gravitating towards that, the visual and the tactile nature of making and if that was that after your first poetry collection came out 
It was, yeah. Um, yeah, because like we were talking about a little bit before, before we got started, I, I started to feel like I just couldn't focus on poetry in the same way um, because for so many reasons, but I just, it was after all of that was put together that I was like, let me, let me just, let me just mess around with other stuff. That's not, it's not an obligation and it's not a thing. It's not anything that I need to claim even as uh, like an identity for myself to, to call myself a visual artist. It, just, it was just play, you know, just turning to something that I didn't, I wasn't already working in. Um, and that's kind of what it feels like now. It, it's nice to, to just mess with, with sewing, for example, which is a big part of what I'm interested in um, and not be too preoccupied with the outcome right away um, and to not even have really too many expectations about what it is that I'm doing, <laughs> which yeah, unfortunately there's, some, poetry there's something is really attractive. Um, so I'm, I'm also uh, starting to work in collage and like erasure for my, my manuscript that I'm working on. Yeah. And there's something really, for me, and I don't want to make assumptions about your practice at all, but for me, it, it seems like it's, there's something really attractive about being a beginner in something and, and, and um, working in a new, a new form or that can provide structure or a different container or different material or different modality. Cause it, I think it, it, it like helps thinking to think differently too. Um, and especially like if you, like, I, you know, I went to an MFA program, so, you know, there are certain things you don't do in poems or certain things like that we get taught are right or wrong or that, or like ways to manage the pacing of your information or whatever. Um, and I, I have been finding for my own self that I've been enjoying, um, you know, delving into this like collage work, like cutting up documents and, you know, pasting flowers over on top of things. Um, and, and not, like you said, like not really knowing, like, I think it definitely goes in my project, but maybe, I, maybe it's a separate project. I'm not sure. Um, I'm really rambling here. If anyone has questions, <laughs> questions <laughs> please, please feel, feel free to unmute and ask your question in person, or you can, you're welcome to drop the question in the chat and I can ask it. Um, yeah, I don't want to take up people's time if you definitely like have a burning question or, um, or want to even compliment our reader tonight. If anyone wants to talk about their own writing <laughs> class, <job> yeah. <laughs> what what was the journal the that you mentioned that your um the visual piece is going to be in? Uh, that's the the Black Poetry Review. It's um it's an interdisciplinary um, journal of poetry and visual art, um with the African American Studies department and creative writing program at the University of Iowa. So it's their like hybrid project. Um, and so that's gonna be up, I believe, May, May or June. Um, okay. sometimes. I'll drop, I'll drop the link into the chat. Um, yeah, I yeah I, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I also added your, um, your website and then um, virtual VSC for all our upcoming um, events. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in your relationship with the first person speaker. Um, and has that, has that changed in working on a longer fiction project um, versus, uh, po po versus poetry? Um, it definitely has. And it's something that I was actually I was just thinking about that as I was trying to make some additions to this manuscript yesterday. Um, in that I, I, I really struggled at first because I felt as though I had to write this novel for some reason in third person or something that was not first person because I, I was afraid of people believing that I was too close to these characters or thinking that I was just writing myself into the, you know, all the kind of fears about using first person. Um, I didn't want to be mistaken for these characters. Um, but I had to kind of give that up when I realized that I was very much trying to access maybe their interiors in ways that I felt I could only do 
if I was in first person um, or that I could get up the closest anyway, if I was in first person. So I originally started with the whole book being written in third person, but now there are about five or six different characters and all of them are in first person. Um, so even though they're different people, they were like right up next to them. Um, and that has been, strangely enough, that actually feels like the right amount of distance because I'm only with each person for so long um, and they're so different to me, these characters feel so different to me that even in first person, they, they sound distinct, even with a lyric driven approach, they, they sound distinct. Um, and that's been, that's been freeing, um, but it's made me want to write less first person poems <laughs> because now I'm like, I don't want anyone to think too much that this is my voice, even though of course it is, but I, I just want to push myself to do different things, I guess. And I don't want to, I don't want, I don't know. I don't know. So the, the poems are now more so removed uh, from, from first person, but the fiction is much more heavily first person, cent you know, POV centric. Yeah, that that's that's really interesting to me. Um, there are there any um, first person novels or stories or writers that you looked at when you made that switch from third to first person? Yeah, um, the person that comes to mind most immediately is Eileen Miles. After I read uh, their their other, well, I think it's probably their second novel, Cool for You. I think all of their novels are basically auto fiction, so heavily first person. Um, and knowing that, that they made those decisions made me feel like, okay, it's okay if I do that too. Um, especially because <laughs> I just, I'm contradicting myself in so many ways. In the novel that I'm working on, there is an auto fiction section that is literally me in the novel. So even though I'm like wanting to get away from these characters, I also made myself a character um, and, and implicating myself directly. Um, so I don't, it still, it still offers, I don't know, it's something about talking through that first person voice though still offers some kind of perspective, I guess, or a, a opportunity to move back and take a broader look, um, which I, which I also am then interested in how that couples with the inherent closeness that first person offers. Um, but yeah, Eileen Miles, um, else would I say? Um, Clar Clarice Lispector kind of does it, but it's, yeah, I guess we can, we'll, we'll claim her too. Um, of course, many, many poets, but I'm trying to think of like fiction people specifically and the ones who I've been reading. Um, yeah, I, 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 none are really coming to mind right away, but I yeah, I, I think the novel that comes to my mind is Ocean Beyond's um, Yeah, career, we're br briefly gorgeous, and That's how um, he uh, basically wrote a very autobiographical novel, but did not want it to be labeled as a memoir. Purposely chose it to not be labeled as a memoir, and said that no, this is a novel, and that these characters warrant being warrant warrant enter warrant enter warrant entering into the literary American literary canon as a novel and not um to be labeled as a memoir um yeah it's it was a, a I don't know I've I read it and um like it's and it's lyrically driven it's not um not necessarily plot driven so yeah, um, that's the one that comes to my mind. But um. basically, anything where it's poets writing fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Which I love. I love when poets you're write right. fiction. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, I wish more poets would write fiction. I know you said that it was kind of daunting for you, but hopefully you'll get to that point, and then you can. Yeah, I just. Um, yeah, I, I. I think maybe like. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just like, I feel like I'm a dedicated, committed poet, um, but like, I definitely wanna, I, my friend calls it the genre creep, <laughs> um, which I which I just is like a funny term. Um, but uh, what I what I really appreciated about um, the visiting writer this month, um, who is Crystal Wilkins, Wilkin, Wilkinson, um, she writes in all genres. She writes, she publishes nonfiction, fiction, poetry, 
Um, she said one of her essays is anthologized in all three, like it's anthologized in a poetry thing, a fiction thing, and a nonfiction anthology. Um, and, and I feel like being able to move flexible, being able to have the writing tools or also like the mind to be able to move flex confidently and flexibly in between different modes is, is like a freedom that I aspire to, I think, um, which I've never really said publicly, I guess. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I am really excited that you were able to share an excerpt from your novel tonight, as well as also your, your visual art um, and your poems. It, it's such a pleasure to see someone who is working in, in multiple different modalities um, because, you know, uh, that's, that's what, you know, creativity comes to us in different ways and asks to be um, pulled down or dis or come through in different ways. So I really appreciate that. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to have had the chance to, I, I definitely was like, this is, I'm doing a lot, you know, I was like, should I just do one genre? No, I <laughs> was, I was engaged I the whole time. I thought you Cheers. managed, I thought you managed your time really well. And I thought, I thought that, um, Sometimes, uh, like if the poetry goes on, like you lose, you lose the reader. Like sometimes like as a listener for me, I'm like, you got me. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, and then now, now I'm back. But yes. because you were able to, you manage the time. Um, I was like with you for the poetry. And then I was like, oh, looking at the images. And then, you know, like you had me also for the novel. So I think that it was um, well, well curated. Cheers, cheers. I'm also just hyperactive, so that's that's the. <laughs> <laughs> but it comes out. Sometimes it comes out and it, it good. <laughs> it turns out good. <laughs> um, are there questions from from the from people who are here tonight? If you don't have questions, it's okay. But I want to make sure that if you did have one, you could ask. Carmela, did you want to ask? Yeah, I wanted. I I loved that. I lo I loved all of it. Thank you so much for the reading and also for the um for sharing your images, and that that's really inspiring to know. Like you know, um, yeah, that yeah. Anyway, um, I but I I loved that the the novel, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about the inspiration. I know you gave us like some context, but if you could talk a little bit more about the inspiration and like sort of like what what you're you know working with in that novel and aspiring yeah. towards yeah thank you thank you Carmela um it's 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 really a lot of things and um I <laughs> I've hesitated to it because sometimes I feel like I'm trying to put too much into it um but for me part of the inspiration is, is coming from just my own encounters and experiences with black queer people in different parts of the world um, in Nigeria and Ghana and Chicago and you know um, and really feeling compelled I guess to create some story from that um, because there's and maybe you can tell from the excerpt that I read there is this global quality to being in the in, you know in the in the wake in the aftermath of racial displacement and enslavement and all of that so there's there's this like spread out feeling in the book that i have of things taking place um not just in one city but in many of them um, and there being a lot of overlap and yet it still feels these identities still so often feel like those which people don't even seem to know that they exist um, in spite of how displaced some of us are. Um, so I, I, I wanted to write, you know, I, my other life, <laughs> my, and part of my other hyperactivity, my other life is that I also find myself really committed to organizing for um, the liberation of queer people in West Africa, you know, most, most simply put. But in this novel, I'm not so much interested in that external reality as I am interested in the in exploring the interiority of queer people's lives, black queer people's lives. So it's not it's of course political because all identities inherently are and those marginalized ones in particular, but it's not 
it's uh, the focus of what I'm looking at is just understanding people's relationships to each other, the, the dynamics that exist between lovers, between friends, between friends who are lovers, between family members, um, what bonds exist for people who are ostracized or cast out from their, fam their you know, natal families or, or their nations even, um, how people come to make those bonds. Um, so it's about, it's about the interior more so than the external reality of having marginalized identities. It's, I'm interested in exploring the stuff that we can't even really show because you're, we're already kind of too hung up on um, just the outside presentation. So that's why so much of it goes really into people's psyches and thinking about ancestral curses, right? And, and demonic possessions, but in a way that's casual, <laughs> if, that, if those things can be casual. Um, you know, thinking about sex work and, and transactional sex um, in a way that is not morally bound to any sense of what we know, but is also, and it's, it's, it's its own thing. It's its own reality. Um, so I, I, from that, when I zoom out and I look at these characters, they are very much, there's a lot of damage maybe, but when I zoom really close in, it, it's very intimate and, and tender. <laughs> tender queers <laughs> are a whole thing, but you know, there's a tenderness that's present in spite of the maybe harsher outside external realities that these characters navigate. Um, I'm interested in, in the tender stuff, I, I think, for this novel, um, which is why I let myself try to get really lush in, in the language of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, I can definitely tell um, like your care and compassion for your the just from the excerpt that you read, having you know the this level of detail and also um, the point of view and also like um, the cadence too in which you read. I also I just felt like you were um, working on it, fully embodying, bringing that that person into um, into being on the page. Um, yeah. Uh, Thank you, Sam. Yeah, Sam. Sam made a nice comment. Well, Thank you. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're we're kind of out of time, but it's it's been really lovely, and it's nice to meet you. I hope to meet Likewise. you in person one day. Yes, and, yes. Um, I like thank you so back. much for your beautiful words and and your art. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope everyone has a great night. Yes, yeah. Thank you to Sarah for, for ushering us. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everyone.